your routing tables. Let's look at some of the answers for the routing tables. We've done R2. Okay, I think we did R2 in the lecture. For router R3, for example, to reach subnet 2.2.0.0 slash 16, send direct. Why? Let's bring back our network from R3 to reach subnet B. We are directly attached to subnet B. There is no next router in this case. If we're at R3, and let's say there's a host, H6, on subnet B. To send to H6, I don't send to a router, I send direct to H6 using the LAN technology. So that's what we say when we say direct, it means there's no next router. Send using a LAN cable or send via the switch inside the, the subnet B direct to H6. So for router 3, anyone on subnet B send direct. In fact, anyone on a subnet that we're directly attached to send direct. Subnet B, C and D. From R3's perspective, we can send direct. B, C and D, send direct. Subnet A, the one to the left, we need to send a router with IP address 2.2.1.1. And so to send to subnet A, send a router 2 interface 1. To send to F, G and E, we send a router 4 interface 0. And importantly, we don't even need to have three separate routes there. We could have routes to F. That is, we could have an entry to F, send to R40. To G, send to R40 and to E send to R40. You can have three entries for those, but we often want to simplify the routing table, keep it as few rows as, it, as possible. And the way that these IP addresses are structured, for F and G, they are subsets of the subnet address for E. That is, the subnet address for E is 3.3 dot zero dot zero slash sixteen. The first sixteen bits correspond to decimals three dot three. So anything uh, that starts with three dot three really is within the subnet E. The way that I've designed this example is that F and subnet F and subnet G are actually within subnet E because they both start with three dot three. So this is a special case where we're actually splitting one subnet into further subnets. So we have our internet, we split it into subnets, but we've done it at another level here, we've split subnet E into further subnets. The way that the addresses are structured, they both start with 3.3, .3, so they, we can think they're both children or within subnet E. Why do that? it makes the routing much simpler because we just need one route now. To reach anything that starts with 3.3, .3, that is subnet E and any of its subnets within that, send a router 4 interface 0. three dot three dot zero dot zero slash 16, send a 2213. Just one entry is needed there. Anyone else? That, don't, that doesn't match the other rows, send a 2215. That's the way to interpret the star value here. Any other value, send to router 1. Now the star value, actually the real way to interpret it is it's 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0, how many, four zeros, slash 0. We'll come back to that when we see our packet uh, structure and see how it's forwarded, forwarded through our routers. Router 4 and 5. Well, similar. Router 4, we can send a route to subnet A, C and D, a route to subnet F and G, directly attached to B and E, and everyone else send via router 1. And subnet 5, 
directly attached to E and F. Everyone else are for interface one. So router 4 and router 5. Router 5 is quite simple because we need the two directly attached subnets. We need to get to uh, is it subnet G and everyone else sends via the, the router on subnet E. Any questions on the routes for the routers? Hosts also need routes. They need routing tables. But often they are very simple because usually a host is only attached to one subnet. For host 1, to reach anyone on subnet A, send direct. To anyone on subnet C, send a router to interface 0. Subnet B, router 2 interface 0. E, F, G, D, router 2 interface 0. Anyone on the internet of the millions of subnets, still router 2 interface 0. So in fact for a host normally we have two entries, one for our local directly attached subnet and one for a default route to the rest of the world. Because there's only one possible router we can send to. Similar for hosts too. So hosts normally have simple routing tables. Now I want you to consider that we have a, a, a web browser on H1 and a web server on H2. And H2 is running a web server. What port number would the web server be using? Web servers use port 80. What port number is my browser using? We don't know. Browsers or clients commonly use dynamic port numbers. It's assigned by the operating system. But for this example, I'll tell you, let's say the operating system assigned 50123 can be a different number, but easy one. We know the IP addresses of H1 and H2. I want you to draw the packet structure for the request, the HTTP request sent from H1 to H2. That is, I've typed in the domain name or the IP address and I've pressed enter and eventually my browser sends a HTTP message to the server via the route R2, R3 to H2. For the packet sent from H1, what's it look like? That's your task. The HTTP request sent by H1, well, the hint, there's four, uh, four protocols in use here. We can think that the application generates a message using the protocol HTTP. So what I'll draw is that the application message we're using HTTP it includes some data. But that HTTP message is not sent directly, it's sent using a transport protocol. Which one? And that transport protocol sent using a network layer protocol. Which one? Put the names in. And then for those particular headers, there are some fields which I want you to fill in, the address fields especially. Fill those in. We know that the HTTP message, HTTP, we've seen it in some previous examples, uses TCP as a transport protocol. 
HTTP requires reliability. TCP is the transport protocol that provides reliability, retransmissions. So the HTTP message is put inside a TCP segment. So you can think that the TCP packet is all of this. The header is here. The payload is the HTTP message. But before we send that, we actually use another protocol to send the TCP packet. We use the internet protocol, IP. So we attach an IP header. This is the IP header. This is the IP payload, the data we put inside the IP datagram. We put one inside another. And in our example, we're using on all of our LANs, the data link layer is Ethernet. I'll just write ETH for Ethernet. This is the entire Ethernet frame. Inside the Ethernet frame, we have an Ethernet header. And inside that, we have an IP datagram. The, the payload of the Ethernet frame is the IP datagram. The payload of the IP datagram is the TCP packet. The payload of the TCP packet is HTTP message. We put one inside the other. So each of the headers have some fields. We're not going to go through all the fields, but just the addressing fields. The TCP header contains a source port and a destination port. This is sent by my web browser to the web server. Web server, easy. Destination port, 80. Web browser, we gave it to you. I, it may be different. I chose my web browser to use 50123, but in a different case, it may be a different value. It's a dynamic port from about 49,000 up to 65,000. So we'll set it to 50,123. The IP header contains a source IP address, destination, protocol number. What are their values? What's the source IP address? This, this is sent by H1, destination H2. The IP addresses identify the original source and the final destination. That is H1 to H2. Your IP addresses may be different, but I chose H1 to be 1.1.1.27 and 4.4.1.156 for H2. So I'll use those values. The protocol number tells IP what's inside the payload. What transport protocol is inside the payload? Well, we can see easy. It's TCP. But we don't specify TCP. We use a, a number to indicate TCP. The number is, everyone yell it out at once. What's the number for TCP? Magic number. It's on the previous, some of the slides. TCP is allocated the number six. Each transport protocol has a unique number. TCP is six. UDP is 17. ICMP is one. And there are many others. So the value of the field here would be six, meaning it's TCP. What's inside IP? TCP. The Ethernet frame sent by H1, what's the source address? Well, it would be the address of H1. It's not the IP address. This is at the data link layer. We use a different type of address in Ethernet. We use a MAC address. Source is H1. The 
the Ethernet or MAC or sometimes hardware address of H1 is this F4, F5, F6 address. You can write the full one, I won't fit it in. Maybe I can fit it in one six five four three two one. So the Ethernet frame is for sending just inside the LAN. What's the destination address? The hardware address of which device or interface? source is the hardware address of H1. The LAN is only subnet A. So we're sending to R2 interface 0. So the hardware address is not that of H2. We, from Ethernet's perspective, we're only using it for internal communications on this subnet. We know nothing about the LAN technology used by H2. To communicate across multiple subnets, we're using IP for that. For Ethernet, it's only internal in the subnet. So we're sending from H1 to R2 interface 0. We know because of our routing table. Our routing table tells H1 to reach 4.4.1.156, you need to send to R2 interface 0. So the hardware address of our frame will be that of R2 interface 0. This 123456 address. So be careful there that the Ethernet frame is just for the, the source in the subnet to the destination in that same subnet. It's not the final destination, it's the next one in the path. The type field in the Ethernet header is similar meaning to the protocol field in the IP header. The protocol field in the IP header tells us what's inside, TCP's inside. The type field tells us what's inside the Ethernet frame. IP is inside and IP has its own number as well and it's not I think on any of the slides it's number 8 meaning IP is inside this Ethernet frame <coughs> So that's the frame sent by H1. Where does it go to? Well, from the routing table, it will go to R2 interface 0. When it arrives at R2, let's look at the routing table for R2. Note the destination IP address, 441156. It gets to R2. R2 gets it. I'm not the destination. This is R2. It's not destined to me. It's destined to someone else. So we look up the routing table. Which field does it match? Which row does it match in the routing table? Well, the destination 441156. It doesn't match this. Now, to check a match, the destination IP address must match the first 16 bits of this address. 
All right, we have four four one one five six. You can convert to binary, but I think you can see that the first sixteen bits of one one zero zero and four four one five six are not the same, so it doesn't match this one. And again, the first sixteen bits of the second address must match. No, it will not. For this row to match, the first 24 bits must match. 4.4.1 are the first 24 bits. Ah, we have 4.4.1, so yes, that is a match. But we, we check the others as well. We may have multiple matches. 4.4.2, the first 24 bits are different than 4.4.1. So no, it doesn't match. 3.3 .3 will not match the first 16 bits. What about this? Does star match? Does 4.4.1.156 match anything? Yes, it is any value. It matches anything. So yes, it does match there. And the way to think, well, the actual way that star is implemented, it's actually a special address of all zeros slash zero. And it's a bit confusing because what it means, the all zeros, zero values must match. So that's what me anything means. Nothing matches mean anything will match. So zero values must match. Well, yes, there are zero or more values that match, therefore it will always match this address. So 4.4.1.156 does match all zeros, or at least zero of the bits match. So yes, does, it matches this row. So in this case we have two rows that match. Which one do we use? We use the one with the most bits that match on the left. 441256, 4410, there are at least 24 bits from the left that match. 0 and 4, there are less than 8 bits that match. Therefore, the one with the longest prefix that matches is that first row that we found. In other words, this one has 24 bits that match. This one has zero bits that match. Use this one. So our next router is 2.2.1.2. .2 now that's the details of how it works, but often it's very easy to see. All right, 441156, yes, it's this one. Well, we only use the default route if none of the others match. That's what it ends up happening. If we get a match, use that. If the routing table is designed correctly, if we don't, use the default route. We send to 2212. We will not draw it. But the next question that you have on your sheet is this packet received by H2. The same packet, it goes via the routers and eventually gets to H2. Went from H1 to R2, R2 sent to R3, and then R3 sends to H2. For that packet that arrives at H2, what does it look like? Well, it looks exactly the same. It's the same packet. What has changed? We're still using the same source and destination port. That doesn't change. IP addresses don't change. We're still using TCP. That doesn't change. The thing that does change is the Ethernet source and destination address. 
So the second packet that you're supposed to draw is exactly the same, except the source address will be that of the router, the destination address with the MAC or hardware address of H2. So the only thing that changes are these hardware addresses along the way. I will not draw that because I have the answer here. Save me time. This was the packet we just drew. Okay, we've drawn that one. This is sent by H1. If we looked at the same packet but received at H2, looks exactly the same, except the source and destination hardware addresses. That's the only thing that's different there. This would be the source address of the router. R3, is it? The router R3. And the destination would be that of H2. Again, this packet is coming from R3 interface 1 going to H2, so we'd use those hardware addresses there. and we'd get the packet received by H2. Everyone got answers for those two? Okay. The last two packets are some special cases just to show that not everything's so easy. And I'll show you the answers. We'll not go through. We'll just explain to finish today. First, our DHCP client. What's DHCP? DHCP is used for your device to discover an address if it doesn't yet have one. First thing to notice, DHCP is an application layer protocol. It uses UDP as a transport layer. Right, just to show a different case. And the port numbers used is also a special case. U TCP is not used, but UDP also uses port numbers. And for DHCP, the server port number is fixed at 67. Unlike web browsing where the client port number changes, it's fixed with DHCP, 68. So I had to look those up to find those exact values. You don't need to remember them. But note that sometimes they are fixed for both client and server. The protocol number for UDP is 17. When we're sending a packet with DHCP, we don't know our IP address. We want to discover one. So we set the source to this special address of all zeros. I don't have an IP address. I want to send a packet. So the source must be set to something. I set it to all zeros. Who can I send it to if I know nothing about the computers? There's only one place I can send it. Send it to everyone. I don't know the router. I don't know other servers, the hosts, because I've just booted my computer. So I send it to the local broadcast address, this 255 address, with the idea someone will get it and respond telling me my IP address. That's the idea here. Source address in the Ethernet is my MAC address. And here's a special one which we were, I didn't intend to cover, but it comes up. To send to everyone on the Ethernet LAN, there's a special hardware address, all Fs or all binary ones. That's not one to remember. We will not cover that in the exam. We'll see it next semester in the lab. Just another case, different transport protocol, the case of the special IP addresses being used. And the last one, ping, because I know everyone used ping a lot in the assignment and you want to know how it works. Ping is another special case. It uses the, what we call the transport protocol ICMP. There is no application layer protocol. It's, again, special in this case. There are no port numbers with ping. So unlike TCP and UDP, it doesn't have port numbers. 
I want to ping everyone on subnet F. I am the source, H1. The destination is the directed broadcast address for subnet F. 3331255. And the protocol number for ICMP is 1. The way that this ping packet would be sent the ping packet would be sent if from H1. I wanted to send to everyone on subnet F, I would send one copy to R2. R2 would use its routing table to send to R4. R4 would use its routing table to send to R5. Then R5 would recognize that the destination is the director broadcast address and send to everyone. It depends on how many are there. So directed broadcasts send a single copy all the way to the final router that delivers to everyone on that subnet. That's the concept of director broadcast. So I could ping everyone on subnet F in theory. So the source MAC would be mine, uh, sorry, the second router. The second router is R4 in the path, the second router R4. The source would be R41, the destination R50. That's where I got those hardware addresses from. Those last two are just some special cases to illustrate different addresses. And I think that's sufficient for today. We're out of time and we've got to the end of our lecture. And the end of our course. So well done for surviving to the end. Hopefully you survive all through through the, through the exam. And we will hopefully see you next semester. We'll do some of this in a lab. And maybe you'll study some more details in another lecture course on computer network architectures.